Welcome. Oh. Um, oh, we're over here. All right, let's get some music going. It's not music. All right, today we're going over React. Working on the front end library certification. We've already done Bootstrap and jQuery and SAS. So we are moving on to React. React, popularized by, popularized by Facebook, is an open source JavaScript library for building user interface that is used to create components, handle state and props, utilize event listeners, and certain lifecycle methods to update um, to update data as it change, changes. React combines HTML with JavaScript functionality to create its own markup language, JSX section will introduce you to all of those concepts and how to implement them for use with your own project. Create a simple JSX element. React is an open source view library created and maintained by Facebook. It's a great tool to render the user interface of modern web applications. React uses a syntax extension of JavaScript called JSX that allows you to write HTML directly within JavaScript. This has several benefits. It lets you use the full progr pro programmatic power of JavaScript within HTML. It helps to keep your code readable. For the most part, JSX is similar to the HTML that you have already learned. However, there are a few key differences that will be covered throughout these challenges. For instance, because JSX is a syntactic, syntactic extension of JavaScript, you can actually write JavaScript directly within JSX. To do this, you simply include the code you want to be treated as JavaScript within curly braces. Uh, keep this in mind since it's used in several future challenges. Or because JSX is not valid JavaScript, JSX code must be compiled into JavaScript. The Transpiler Babel Babel is a popular tool for this process. For your convenience, it's already added behind the scenes for these challenges. If you happen to write syntactically invalid JSX, you will see the first test in these challenges fail. It's worth noting that under the hood, the challenges are calling React DOM that render you pass in the JSX. Um, comma, document, get element by ID, root. This function call so it places your JSX into React's own lightweight representation of the DOM. React then uses snapshots of its own DOM to optimize updating only specific parts of the actual DOM. Um, current code uses JSX to assign a div element to the constant JSX. Replace the div with an H1 element and add the text hello JSX item. Alright, so it wants us to change this to an H1. A complex JSX element. The last challenge was a simple example of JSX. The JSX can represent more complex HTML as well. One important thing to know about nested JSX is that it must return a single element. So one parent element would wrap all of the other levels of nested elements. For instance, several JSX elements written as siblings with no parent wrapper element will not transpile. Here's an example. 
the spare graphs wrapped with a parent div. That's valid. This is not valid. It's just like view. So that's nice. Uh, define a new constant in JSX that renders a div which contains the following elements in order. An H1, a P, and an unordered list that contains three list items. You can include any text you want within each element. Rendering multiple elements like this, you can wrap them all in parentheses, but it's not strictly required. Also notice this, challenges, this challenge uses a div tag to wrap all the child elements within a single pair element. If you remove the div, the JSX will no longer transpile. Keep this in mind since it will apply when you return JSX elements in React components. a new constant JSX that renders a div. So we need a constant, we'll write const, JSX, um, and then we have our div. And then it wants us to have the H1 element. Um, paragraph element. unordered list element and the tests every property length of undefined this needs to have three list items oh, that's right so we'll take this one paste paste there's three run the tests comments in jsx jsx is a syntax that gets compiled into valid javascript Sometimes for readability, you might need to add comments to your code. Like most programming languages, JSX has its own way to do this. To put comments inside JSX, you use the syntax, curly brackets, and then kind of like a HP style comment to wrap around the comment text. The code editor has a JSX element similar to what you created in the last challenge, add a comment somewhere within the provided div element without modifying the, modifying the existing H1 or P element. So it wants us to make a comment, so we'll do a comment right here. Um, our header. Uh, run the tests, and that should do it. Render HTML elements to the DOM. So far you've learned that J JSX is a convenient tool to write readable HTML within JavaScript. With React, we can render this JSX directly to the HTML DOM using React's rendering API known as React DOM. React DOM offers a simple method to render React elements to the DOM, which looks like this. React DOM.render, component we're rendering, and the target node. The first argument is the React element or component. 
that you want to render, and the second argument is the DOM node that you want to render the component to. As you would expect, React DOM dot render must be called after the JSX element declarations, just like how you must declare variables before using them. Code editor has a simple JSX component. Use the React DOM render method to render this comp this component to the page. You can pass the find JSX elements directly in as the first argument. Use document get element by ID to select the DOM node to render them to. There is a div with ID equals challenge node available for you to use. Make sure you don't change the JSX constant. We'll write our code down here. Um, React DOM render. And then we can pass the JSX as the first. We use document dot get element by ID. Um, using this ID, and that makes it work. HTML class in JSX. Now that you're getting comfortable writing JSX, you may be wondering how it differs from HTML. So far it may seem that HTML and JSX are exactly the same. One key difference in JSX is that you can no longer use the word class to, to, to define HTML classes. This is because class is a reserved word in JavaScript. Instead, JSX uses class name. In fact, the naming convention for all HTML attributes and event references in JSX becomes camel case. For example, a click event in JSX is on click instead of on click. Likewise, on change becomes on change. While this is a subtle difference, it is an important one to keep in mind moving forward. Apply class of my div to the div provided in the JSX code. Um, so we do class name, my div, right. learn about self-closing JSX tags. So far you've seen how JSX differs from HTML. The key way with the use of class name versus class for defining HTML classes. Another important way in which JSX differs from HTML is in the idea of the self-closing tag. In HTML, almost all tags have both an opening and closing tag. Closing tag always has a forward slash before the tag name that you are closing. However, there are special instances in HTML called self-closing tags or tags that don't require both an opening and closing tag before another tag can start. For example, the line break tag can be written as br or as br with an ending slash, but should never be written as br with the ending tag since it doesn't contain any content. In JSX, the rules are a little different. Any JSX element can be written with a self-closing tag, and every element must be closed. The line break tag, for example, must always be written as br with n slash in order to be a valid JSX that can be tr transpiled. Div, on the other hand, can be written as this or just div or normal opening and closing. The difference is that in the first syntax version, there's no way to include anything in the div. You'll see in later challenges that this syntax is useful when rendering React components. Fix the errors in the code editor so that it is valid JSX and successfully transpiles. Make sure you don't change any of the content. You'll need to close tags where they are needed. Alright, so... 
leave the comment and change code below this line. So this whole lesson was about ending stuff, right? These need to be ended since they don't have closing tags. I believe that's it. Div should contain a BR tag. Oh, we gotta remove the comment. Gotcha. A stateless functional component. Components are the core of React. Everything in React is a component, and here you'll learn how to create one. There are two ways to create a React component. The first way is to use a JavaScript function. Finding a component in this way creates a stateless functional component. The concept of a state in an application will be covered in later challenges. For now, think of a stateless component as one that can receive data and render it, but does not manage or track changes to that data. We'll cover the second way to create a React component in the next challenge. Create a component with a function. You simply write a JavaScript function that returns either JSX or null. One important thing to note is that React requires your function name to begin with a capital letter. Here's an example of a stateless functional component that assigns an HTML class in JSX. After being transpiled, the div will have a CSS class name of custom class. We have a constant demo component function that returns some JSX. Because a JSX component represents HTML, you could put several components together to create a more complex HTML page. This is one of the key advantages of, ad, advantages of the component architecture React provides. It allows you to compose your UI from many separate isolated components. This makes it easier to build and maintain complex user interface. The code editor has a function called my component. Complete this function so it returns a single div element which contains some string of text. Text is considered a child of the div element so you will not be able to use a self-closing tag. Um, so in the example we have our function, we need to return something here from the function. Sometimes I forget that. So we'll write that out back up here. And inside it wants us to have a single div element which contains some string of text. And actually we don't I don't think we have to wrap. It's only sometimes so let's try let's try not doing that so div some string of text pretty simple awesome create a rack component the other way to define a React component is with the ES6 class syntax. In the following example, kitten extends React component. Uh, class kitten extends React component, constructor props, super props. We have a constructor. Super, I think, takes the, the React component stuff and uses it. Here it stops. And it render it has render function that returns some JSX it looks like. It just says hi in H1. This creates an ES6 class kitten which extends the React component class. So the kitten class now has access to many useful React features such as local state and lifecycle hooks. Don't worry if you aren't familiar with these terms yet, they will be covered in greater detail in later challenges. Also notice that the kitten class has a constructor defined within it that calls super. They use the super to call the constructor of the parent class, in this case React component. 
Constructor is a special method used during the initialization of objects that are created with the class keyword. It is best practice to call a component's constructor with super and pass props to both. This makes sure the component is initialized properly. For now, know that it is standard for the code to be included. Soon you will see other uses for the constructor as well as props. My component is defined in the code editor using class syntax. Finish writing the render method so it returns a div element that contains an h1 with the text hello react. Um, so we're just finishing this render method and we're gonna, it's the same thing as last time, we're gonna return some uh, JSX. Since it's really short JSX, I'm not gonna wrap it in parentheses as I'm not a fan of complexity just because Let's see here. H1, it needs to say hello, React. Sweet. Create a component with composition. Now we will look at how we can compose multiple React components together. Imagine you are building an app and have created three components, a navbar, dashbar, and footer. Uh, dashbar dashboard. To compose these components together, you could create an app parent component, which renders each of these three components as children. To render a component as a child in a React component, you include the component name written as a custom HTML tag in JSX. For example, in the render, render method, you could write, we have our app, and then you just just like custom HTML tags. Uh, when Re React encounters a custom HTML tag that references another component, a component named wrapped in brackets, like in this example, it renders the markup for that component in the location of the tag. This should illustrate the parent-child relationship between the app component and the navbar dashbar dashboard and footer. In the code editor, there is a simple functional component called child component and a react component called parent component. Pose the two together by rendering the child component within the parent component. Make sure to close the child component tag with a forward slash. Note, child component is defined with an ES6 arrow function because this is a very common practice when using react. However, know that this is just a function. If you aren't familiar with the arrow function syntax, please refer to the JavaScript section. All right, we are familiar with that, so we don't have to write function. We're just using the ES6 syntax. Um, we'll... Last parent com component extends React component, and it's doing all this. So we have to change the code below this line. I'm the parent, and you need to show the child component um that's wrong because it has to be in brackets and we have to close it all right React to render nested components. The last challenge showed a simple way to compose two components. But there are many different ways you can compose components with React. Component composition is one of React's powerful features. When you work with React, it is important to start thinking about your user interface in terms of components like the app example in the last challenge. You break down your UI into its basic building blocks and those pieces become the components. This helps you to separate the code responsible for the UI from the code responsible for handling your application logic. It can greatly simplify the development and maintenance of complex projects. There are two functional components defined in the code editor called types of fruit and fruits. Take the types of fruit 
compose it and compose it or nest it within the fruits component. Then take the fruits component and nest it within the types of food component. The result should be a child component nested within a parent component, which is nested within a parent component of its own. Oh my god. So we have our types of fruits. We have fruits. This is where we're changing our code. We have another spot we're changing our code. Take the type yeah, um, within the fruit. So it, here it wants us. Does this have to be wrapped? I don't know. We'll find out. Take the types of fruit component and compose it or nest it within the fruits component. Then take the fruits component and then put it in here. All right. don't need to wrap it. Alright. So we have our function type of fruit. Fruits. And then we put the fruits in, in the types of food. And that makes everything show up. So if we had to skip this step, quite have worked. Alrighty. Compose React components. As the challenges continue to use more complex compositions with React components and JSX, there's one important point to note. Rendering ESX, ES6 style class components within other components is no different than rendering the simple components you used in the last few challenges. You can render JSX elements, stateless functional components, and ES6 class components within other components. In the code editor, the types of food component is already rendering a component called vegetables. Also, there is the fruits component from the last challenge. Nest two components inside the fruits, first non-citrus, then citrus. Both of these components are provided for you in the background. Next, nest the fruits class component into the types of food component below the H1 header and above vegetable. The, re re the result should be a series of nested components which chooses two different component types. So we're changing code here and here. So it wants us to nest two things inside of fruits. That's this one. Uh, non citrus and citrus. Next, nest the fruits class component into the type of food component. So we move down here. This is our types of food. Um, class component to the DOM. You may remember using the React DOM API in an earlier challenge to render JSX elements to the DOM. The process for rendering React components will look very similar. The past few challenges focused on components and composition, so the rendering was done for you behind the scenes. However, none of the React code you write will render to the DOM without making a call to the React DOM API. Here's a refresher on the syntax. 
React DOM render, components render, and the target node. First argument is the React component that you want to render. The second is the argument. The second argument is the DOM node that you want to render the component within. React components are passed into React DOM render a little differently than JSX elements. For JSX elements, you pass in the name of the element that you want to render. However, for React components, you need to use the same syntax as if you were rendering a nested component, for example. However, for React components, you need to use the same syntax as if you were rendering a nested component. Okay, so if like you're doing it Okay, so if you're if you want to render a component in the JSX, you do it this way. Both the fruits and vegetable components are defined for you behind the scenes render both components as children of the types of food component then render types of food to the DOM there's a div with ID challenge node available for you to use so it's just getting us familiar with writing these out And now it's having us render it out where it was doing it for us before so that we get used to writing this. And we're going to be rendering a component this time, so we're not going to do it like we did JSX. We we'll just do like we would use it anywhere else so far. And then. We use document get element by ID and pass in the ID of challenge node. And make sure that render is spelt right. And it will work with like that.
All right, I'm back. Uh, my mom called me. It was just, uh, it was like a accidental call, but I just wanted to make sure she was all right because she's diabetic and sometimes she goes low and things aren't good. She needs ways to get a hold of me, so just wanted to make sure she was all right. Alright, so this should be working. Write a React component from scratch. Now that you've learned the basics of JSX and from React components, it's time to write a component on your own. React components are the core building blocks of React applications, so it's important to become very familiar with writing them. Remember, a typical React component is an ES6 class which extends React component. It has a render method that returns HTML from JSX or null. This is the basic form of React component. Once you understand this well, you will be prepared to start building more complex React projects. Define a class my component that extends React component. It renders it, its render method should return a div that contains an H1 tag to text my first React component in it use this text exactly the case and punctuation matter. Make sure to call the constructor from your component too. Render this component to the DOM using React DOM render. There is a div with ID challenge node available for you to use. Alright, so const um, my component equals and we'll use the sx syntax to make a function oh wait that can't be right that's not right using the class all right so we have to use the class syntax my component Extends um, React component and then we need our constructor function method um, which returns some JSX keep this one short and we'll copy this since it has to be exact Just a few keystrokes um, I think I'm missing something, like I'm supposed to, uh... Or something, I don't know. And then we need to... Render this. Um, it's a component, so we do it this way. And... Use document get element by ID to find challenge dash node ID element my first rack component appears sweet sweet <clears throat> pass props to a stateless functional component the previous challenges covered a lot about creating and composing JSX elements um, functional components and ES6 style class components in React. With this foundation, it's time to look at another feature very common in React, props. 
In React, you can pass props or properties to child components. Say you have an app component which renders a child component called welcome that is a stateless functional component. You can pass welcome a user property by writing welcome and then the user equals mark. You can you use custom HTML attributes that React provides support for to pass the property user to the component welcome. Since welcome is a stateless functional component, it has access to this value like so. So we pass the props. Um, right. And then we can use the props.user. It is standard to call this value props, and when dealing with stateless functional components, you basically consider it as an argument to a function which returns JSX. You can pet, you can access the value of the argument in the function body. Class components, you will see this is a little different. There are calendar and current date components in the code editor. When rendering current date from the calendar component, pass in a property of date assigned to the current date from the JavaScript's date object. Then access this prop in the current date component showing its value within the key tags. Note that for the for prop values to be evaluated as JavaScript, they must be enclosed in the curly brackets. For instance, uh, here. So it's pretty similar to view in that respect. Slightly different. Um, so there are calendar and current date components in the code editor when rendering current date. In the calendar component, pass in a property of date assigned to the current date from the JavaScript's date object. Then access this prop in the current date component showing its value within the p tag. Um, my phone is fucking haunted. to date and it gave us the example and if we want to use the date function we have to do it like so um, we pass in the date to the current date I see they call this props not params So the current date we have here, we pass the props to it. And then because this is JavaScript and not like HTML, wrap it so that it's it's not user, it's date. It's the current date. Alright, last challenge demonstrated how to pass information from a parent component to a child component as props or properties. This challenge looks at how arrays can be passed as props. Pass an array to a JSX element and must be treated as JavaScript and wrapped in curly braces. So to pass an array, you just put it in the curly braces, which just says, you know, it's jobs. The child component then has access to the array property colors. Join array methods such as join can be used when accessing the property. Um, this will join all colored array items into a comma separated string and produce green, blue, and red. 
Later, we will learn about the common methods to render arrays of data in React. There are list and to-do components in the code editor. When rendering each list from the to-do component, pass in a tasks property assigned to an array of to-do tasks. For example, walk dog, workout, and access this tasks array in the list component showing its value within the P element. Use the join um, by common and space to display the props tasks array in the P element as a common separated list. Today's list should have at least two tasks and tomorrow should have at least three. All right, um, so we're gonna have to change this here. Here's our list. What's up, Digicrests? How's it going? Um, so we have two lists here in this to-do component. We're gonna have to change these. We're gonna have to pass in a tasks property assigned to an array of the to-do tasks, for example. All right, so it's basically saying we need to pass tasks here. Um, and to use an array, we have to wrap it in curly brackets, which basically just says this stuff's JavaScript in here. So task one and task two. This today's list should have at least two tasks and for the tomorrow, so it needs at least three. So we'll do that here. We didn't copy the end bracket here, so we got some errors. That fixes it. Um, the next step, we need to fix the code to use this. Um, all right, so we got props, tasks, and then we can join it, and it wants us to join by a common space. So we get our tasks. Use default props. React, React also has an option to set default props. You can assign default props to a component as a property on the component itself, and React assigns the default prop if necessary. This allows you to specify what a prop value should be if no value is explicitly provided. For example, if you declare my component dot default props equals uh, Early brackets, object, whatever, notation, location equals San Francisco. You have defined a location prop that is set to the string of San Francisco, unless you specify otherwise. React assigns default props if props are undefined, but if you pass null as the value for a prop, it will remain null. Code editor shows a shopping cart component. Define a default props. Define default props on this component which specify a prop items with a value of zero. So we have our shopping cart component. After we've um, done all this, we'll take it and we'll do run this on it, I guess. And then we'll just have this object here with items and items is zero. How are you doing today, Digicrests? Override default props. The ability to set default props is a useful feature in React. The way to override default props is the, to explicitly Set the prop values for a component. The shopping cart component now renders a child 
component items. This item's component has a default prop quantity set to the integer 0. Override the default prop by passing in a value of 10 for quantity. Now, remember that the syntax to add a prop to a component looks similar to how you add HTML attributes. However, since the value for quantity is an integer, it won't go in quotes, but it should be wrapped in curly braces. For example, 100. This syntax tells JSX to interpret the value within the braces directly as jobs. You know what, man? Um... Don't worry about it. Oh shit, dude. It's it's actually funny because like when I first started, like there were certain ways you did stuff, and then like CSS came along and you did things all this certain way, and it was like best practice. And now it's kind of like there's stuff that was like anti-pattern where like if you did that, that was bad because. It was not a good thing. It was slow or whatever. And now, it's kind of come full circle and like, I don't know. It's like you're, when you first start coding, your code is like simpler and you think it's shit. And then you get a little better and everything like it's super complex and like you, you're like, yeah, I'm doing this better. Then you get even better and you realize, oh. Like, I don't, I don't have to do all that, really. All the time. For me, at least. Alright, so it wants us to change and overwrite the default quantity on this. Um, and it's saying that... We can note that it's like HTML, but if we do this, when it gets passed, it's going to be a string. Um, so what it wants us to do instead is put it in these curly brackets, which just says interpret this as JavaScript. So it won't be a string, so we don't have to like turn it into a number later. case we need to so quantity equals 100 is that you know i wanted us to do 10 and that should do it current quantity of items in cart 10 we get rid of this it says zero anyways refactoring is good any anyway you're always there's always little things that I could do better. Use prop types to define the props you expect. React to prop provides useful type checking features to verify that components receive props of the correct type. For example, your application makes an API call to retrieve data that you expect to be in an array, which is then passed to a component as a prop. You can set prop types on your component to require the data to be of type array. This will throw a useful warning when the data is of any other type. It's considered a best practice to set prop types when you know the type of a prop ahead of time. You can define a prop types property for a component in the same way you define props. Doing this will check that props of a given key are, rep are present with a given type. Here's an example to require the type function for a prop called handle click. We got my component, prop types, handle click, prop types, the function is required. This example above the prop types dot funk funk. Yeah. Part says that handle click is a function. Adding is required tells React that handle click is required, a required property for that component. You'll see a warning if that prop isn't provided. Also notice that funk represents function. 
Among the seven JavaScript primitive types, function and boolean, written as bool, are the only two that use unusual spelling. In addition to the primitive types, there are other types available. For example, you can check that a prop is a React element. Please refer to the documentation for all of the options. As of React version 15.50, prop types is, a, is imported independently from React, like this. Find prop types for the items and component to require quantity as a prop and verify that it is of the type number. So this is something that I might kind of disagree with. I don't like best practices. And I think a best practice saying you always have to use types, especially when you know what it is ahead of time. If I know what the type is ahead of time, and I know that it's not going to change. Is a type necessary? Or is it just extra code that's not necessary? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> so, but that's okay. Types can be useful. If you don't know what's being passed. If you're being passed like stuff from the public. But I don't know if your stuff's all internal. I wouldn't even bother, in my opinion. I don't know. And it also wants us to render the shopping cart. That's what I'm guessing. Oh no, it's all good. What's it want us to do here? prop types for oh we're doing prop types now this isn't the last thing so we need to do items the prop types um yeah that's equals require quantity as a prop and verify that it is of type number Uh, so quantity is the prop that we're looking for and we want the prop types number I believe and is required. So the shopping cart component should render, seems to be rendering, the items component should render, that seems to be rendering, the items component should include a props, prop types check that requires quantity to be a number, I believe that we have that set up, we do, alright. Access props using this props, the last several challenges covered the basic ways to pass props to child components. But what if the child component that you're passing a prop to is an ES6 class component rather than a stateless functional component? The ES6 class component uses a slightly different convention to access props. Anytime you refer to a class component within itself, use the this keyword. That to access props within a class component, you practice the code that you use to access it with this. For example, if an ES6 class component has a prop called data, you write this props data in JSX. Render an instance of the return temp password component in the parent component reset password. Here, give return temp password a prop of temp password and assign it to a value of a string that is at least eight characters long. Within the child, return temp password. Access the temp password prop within the strong tags to make sure the user sees the temporary password. All right, that's a lot of a lot of stuff. All right, um, reset password. We've generated a new password for you. Please reset this password from your account settings ASAP. Our tests say that the reset password component should return a single div element. Um.
So we'll render an instance of the return temp password component and the parent component reset password. So this is reset password. We want to render um, return temp password here. So we got your temporary password is, uh, which is coming from here. Here, give return temp password a prop of temp password. Um, so we need to pass a password here and assign it a value of a string that's at least eight characters long. Within the child return temp password, access the temp password prop within the strong tags to make sure the user sees the temporary password. So right here, um, this is JSX or JavaScript, so we have to wrap it in brackets, I believe. So we use this uh, props. We have the props here. Um, And I think that I spelt this wrong. Our temporary password is secret pass. So I think that's everything. Sweet. Review using props with stateless functional components. Except for the last challenge, You've been passing props to stateless functional components. These components act like pure functions. They accept props as input and return the same view every time they are passed the same props. You may be wondering what state is, and the next challenge will cover it in more detail. Before that, here's a review of the terminology for components. A stateless functional component is any function you write which accepts props and returns JSX. A stateless component, on the other hand, is a class that extends React component, but does not use internal state, which is covered in the next challenge. Finally, a stateful component is any component that does maintain its own internal state. You may see stateful components referred to simply as components or React components. A common pattern is to try to minimize statefulness and to create stateless functional components wherever possible. This helps contain your state management to a specific area of your application. In turn, this improves development and maintenance of your app by making it easier to follow how changes to state affects its behavior. The code editor has a campsite component that renders a camper component as a child. Define the camper component and assign it a default props of name camperbot inside the camper component. Render any code that you want, but make sure to have one P element that includes only the name value that is passed in as a prop. Finally, define prop types on the camper com component to require a name to be provided as a prop and verify that it is of the type of string. Ooh. All right. Find the camper component and assign it, it default props. I hope I'm doing this the right way. Um, so we have our constructor, we pass the props. We do super, so the parent just pass the props and the parent runs its stuff. We'll have a render function or method here. Um, and we will make this one bigger. 
not a single line. Um, let's see here. So it wants us to have P tag. JSX here, so we do this props the name. Um, we have our camper class, it wants us to. Wants us to set the prop types for the class. Um, we're looking at the name component or prop property. And let's see here. Feel like I did something wrong. Uh, we'll find out soon enough. Props that it is um, require name to be provided as a prop and verify that it is of the type string. So this sh we're only changing code below this line. So if there's no errors, it's expecting an error. Super expression must either be null or a function not undefined. Assign it a default. Um, is that it? I'm not quite sure. Super expression must either be null or a function, not undefined.
All right, well, we're going to use the docks here. Um, Um, additional excuse of state up, thank you, Rex. I wanted some props, maybe we'll be in here. Get advanced guides. Checking with prop types. Okay. So prop types dot string uh, is required. Let's see if that fixes anything. Super expression must either be null. Does that mean? Oh, this wrong? Look at that. Capital C, that lowercase. So, camper bot is showing up. I believe it is required. Having a default, if we didn't have a default. Um, I don't believe it would work. All right. A stateful component. One of the most important topics in React is state. State consists of any data your application needs to know about that can change over time. You want your apps to respond to state changes and, rep and present an updated UI when necessary. React offers a nice solution for the state management of modern web applications. You create state in Re a React component by declaring a state property on the component class in its constructor. This initializes the component with state when it is created. The state property must be set to a JavaScript object. The player it looks like this. The state, uh, with the state here, you have access to the state object throughout the life of your component. You can update it, render it in your UI, and pass it as props to child components. The state object can be as complex or as simple as you need it to be. Note that you must create a class component by extending rack component in order to create state like this. There's a component in the code editor that is trying to render a name property from its state. However, there is no state defined. Initialize the component with state in the in the constructor. Assign your name to property of name. So we're in the constructor here. Um, this dot state equals. So we have state here. Um, we need our name sweet um well i'm familiar with view and so it's pretty pretty much the same but yeah I would I always have to reference docs either way um, 
so I use quite a few different things, so... Like, remembering all this stuff. Writing J JavaScript, too, I have not done much class stuff, so it's all new. I don't know, it's... it seems... So far, I prefer Vue. Um... If, I don't know, React's popular, so, I don't know. It's not like that much, it's not like it's bad, or anything. Like, it's pretty good, but I think so far there's some things where view I could do it. Maybe a little simpler, without so much JavaScript looking stuff. Um, so we're learning how to render the state in the user interface. Once you define a component's initial state, you can display any part of it in the UI that is rendered. If a component is stateful, it will always have access to the data and state in its render method. You can access the data with this.state. If you want to access the state value within the return of the render method, you have to enclose the value in curly braces. State is one of the most powerful features of components in React. It allows you to track important data in your app and render a UI in response to changes in this data. If your data changes, your UI will change. React uses what is called a virtual DOM to keep track of changes behind the scenes. When state data updates, it triggers a re-render of the components using that data, including child components that receive the data as a prop. React updates the actual DOM, but only where necessary. This means you don't have to worry about changing the DOM, you simply declare what the UI should look like. Note that if you make a component stateful, no other components are aware of its state. Its state is completely encapsulated or local to that component, unless you pass state data to a child component as props. This notion of encapsulated state is very important because it allows you to write certain logic, then have the logic contained and isolated in one place in your code. In the code editor, my component is already stable. Find an h1 tag in the components render method which renders the value of name from the component state. The h1 should only render the value from state and nothing else. In JSX, any code you write with the curly braces will be treated as JavaScript. So to access the value from state, just enclose the reference and curly braces. Um, I believe Vue does like a virtual DOM sort of thing. Editor, my component is already stateful. Find an H1. Man, I need to remember to. The code editor, my component is already stateful. To find an H1 tag in the components render method, which renders the value of name from the component state. The H1 should only render the value from state, nothing else. I think we read that. All right, we read all that. Um, so it wants us to return the name. So I believe we just do this state name. And we get free code camp. Look at that. I'm so ugly. Oh, there's other stuff. Um, H1. H1. Oh. There we go. Render state in the user interface another way. There is another way to access state in a component in the render method before the return statement. You can write JavaScript directly. For example, you can declare functions, access data from state or props, form computations on this data, and so on. Then you can assign any data to variables which you have access to in the return statement. 
the my component render method, define a const name name and set it equal to the name value in the component state. Because you can write JavaScript directly in this part of the code, you don't have to enclose this reference in curly braces. Next, in the return statement, render this value in, in an h1 tag using the variable name. Remember, you need to use the JSX syntax curly braces for JavaScript in the return statement. So it's saying up here, we can just write normal ass JavaScript. Um, so it wants us to pull the name into a variable that's a constant. So constant name equals um, this state name. We're using ES6, so we don't need to use semicolons to end stuff. It's beautiful, in my opinion. Then from here, we just need to use name. But we also need the h1 tag from before, I believe. Yes. Sweet. Set state with this set state. Previous challenges covered component state and how to initialize state in the constructor. There's also a way to change the component state. React provides a method for updating component state called set state. You call the set state method within your component class like so. This set state passing in an object with key value pairs. The keys are your state properties and the values are the updated state data. For instance, if we were storing a username in state and wanted to update it, it would look like this. This set state with our new object with the updates. React expects you to never modify state directly. Instead, always use this set state when state changes occur. Also, you should note that React may batch multiple state updates in order to improve performance. What this means is that state updates through the set state method can be asynchronous. There's an alternative syntax for the set state method which provides a way around this problem. This is rarely needed, but it's good to keep in mind. Please consult the React documentation for further details. There's a button element in the code editor which contains an on-click handler. This handler is triggered when the button receives a click event in the browser and runs the handle click method defined in on my component. Within the handle click method, update the component state using this set state. Set the name property in state to equal the string react rocks. The button watch the rendered state update. Don't worry if you don't fully understand how the click handle code works at this point. It's covered in upcoming challenges. So we have our component here. We have our initial state. Um, we have our click handler. And this handle click is this handle click bind this. What is this dude okay um then we have our on click here and this is going to use this handle click this shows the initial state name so when we are in here we need to do this set state and pass in an object with our new state that says react rocks and now when we click the button it changes. I did this to a class method. In addition to setting and updating state, you can also define methods for your component class. A class method typically needs to use the this keyword so it can access properties on the class, such as state and props, inside the scope of the method. There are a few ways to allow your class methods to access this. One common way is to explicitly bind this in the constructor so this becomes bound to the class methods when the component is initialized. You may have noticed the last challenge used this handle click equals this handle click bind this. Yes we did for its handle click method in the constructor. Then when you call a function like this.setState within your class method, this refers to the class and will not be undefined. Alright, I see. No. The this keyword is one of the most confusing aspects of JavaScript, but it plays an important role in React. Although its behavior here is totally normal, these lessons aren't the place for an in-depth review of this, so please refer to other lessons in the above if the above is confusing. 
code editor has a component with a state that keeps track of an item count. It also has a method which allows you to increment this item count. However, the method doesn't work because it's using the this keyword that is undefined. Fix it by explicitly binding this to the add item method in the components constructor. Next, add a click handler to the button element in the render method. It should trigger the add item method when the button receives a click event. Remember that the method you pass to the on click handler needs curly braces because it should be interpreted directly as jobs. Once you complete the above steps, you should be able to click the button and see the item count increment in the HTML. All right. So we have our initial state of a zero for item count. We're gonna do some set stuff here. Um, this is already set for us. We have to do, we have to add it. So on click equals this uh, add item. I believe that's how we write that out. Um, so the thing we have to do here is bind. To do that, this handle click equals this handle click bind this except it's not handle click it's add item um oh no okay thank god okay so it works so this really we have add item here and what this just does is this add item is going to equal this add item so whatever this is but we're binding the this into it so that we can use it it wasn't working before without this because this isn't a bound so undefined set state you can't use set state on undefined um but we can use it on our component so we need to bind this into this method. Use state to toggle an element. You can use state in React applications in more complex ways than what you've seen so far. One example is to monitor the status of a value, then render the UI conditionally based on this value. There are several different ways to accomplish this, and the code editor shows one method. My component has a visibility property which is initialized to false. The render method returns one view if the value of visibility is true and a different view if it is false. Currently, there is no way of updating the visibility property in the component state. The value should toggle back and forth between true and false. There is a click handler on the button which triggers a class method called toggle visibility. Find this method so the state of visibility toggles to the opposite value when the method is called. If visibility is false, the method sets it to true and vice versa. Finally, click the button to see the conditional rendering of the component based on its state. Hit don't forget to bind the this keyword to the method and this constructor. So right here it wants us to bind. Um, we haven't created the function. Let's create the function first for the method. So it's called toggle visibility. Um, we have that. So now we can do this toggle visibility equals this dot bind this so now we have access to this inside our tiger visibility method um, and I believe we can do this 
that set state and we have our object here invisibility is going to be the opposite so we're going to use the not for the exclamation point to kind of tell us that it's going to be not the following um it's going to be not this state visibility so that just that's a toggle um for the first time you click it, it should see it and make it true and then false so on um So I think that's it. So we can set this, click me, now you see me, now you don't. Now you see me, now you don't. Okay. Let's run the tests. We're good to go. Ready, simple counter. You can design a more complex stateful component by combining the concepts covered so far. These include initializing state, writing methods that set state, and assigning click handlers to trigger these methods. The counter component keeps track of account value in state. There are two buttons which call methods increment and uh, decrement. 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 De decrement. I don't know how to say that word. Uh, write these methods so the counter value is incremented or decremented by one when the appropriate button is clicked. Also create a reset method so when the reset button is clicked, the count is set to zero. No. Make sure you don't modify the class names of the buttons. Also remember to add the necessary binding bindings for the newly created methods in the constructor. So it has all of the stuff that we need. We just have to define it. So let's start by making the methods. First we have increment. Um, and then we have uh, decrement. And then we have reset. Um, and that's it. So we need to bind the this into those so we need to do this increment equals this this is really annoying um this this equals this we'll bind this into it um reset or this set equals this reset dot bind this this is nasty um, please tell me there's some way not to do this every time. Uh, so now we have access to this within these methods, so we can begin building them. Um, this set state. We'll pass in our object, and it's going to just say count, and it's going to equal this state count. Um, plus one, and then we have this one, which we'll use this set state again, count, um, this state count minus one, and then for this one, we'll have this set state again. As an object for count, this state count equals zero. And I believe that should do it, so let's... It works. Everything works. Create a controlled input. Your application may have more complex interactions between state and the rendered UI. For example, form control elements for text input, such as input and text area, maintain their own state in the DOM as the user types. With React, you can move this mutable state into a React component state. The user's input becomes part of the application state, so React controls the value of that input field. 
Typically, if you have React components with input fields the user can type into, it will be a controlled input form. Code, the code editor has the skeleton of a component called controlled input to create a controlled input element. A component state is already initialized with an input property that holds an empty string. The value represents the text a user types into the input field. First create a method called handle change that has a parameter called event. When the method is called, it receives an event object that contains a string text from input element. You can access the string with event target value inside the method. Update the input property of the component state with this new string. In the render method, create the input element above the h4 tag. Add a value attribute which is equal to the input property of the component state. Then add an onChange event handler to set the handle change method. When you type in the input box, that text is processed by the handle change method, set as the input property in the local state, and rendered as the value in the input box on the page. The component state is the single source of truth regarding the input data. Last but not least, don't forget to add the necessary bindings in the constructor. Oh, great. All right. So we have our controlled input, this state, the input. Um, first create a method called handle change. So we'll do that right here. Handle change. Um, this has a parameter called event. When that method is called, it receives an event object that contains a string of text from the input element. And access the string with the event target value inside the method. Update the input property of the component state with this new string. So what we want to do is we want to do this state. Uh, no, set state. And we pass in our object. We'll close this out and then continue. And we're going to set input equal to the event target value. Um... the input property of the component state with this new string we've done that in the render method create the input element above the h4 tag right here um, add a value attribute which is equal to the input property of the component state so I believe we just do input type equals text um, the value will equal, and I think we have to use the curly brackets here. It will be this state input. Um, we'll close that out. So we have our controlled input there. Right now it says nothing. It won't let us type yet. Okay. Then add an on change event handler set to the handle change method. So we need on change here. Um, I think that's how you do it. I don't think it's working because we don't have it bound. So let's bind it here. Uh, this handle change is equal to this handle change. Bind this. Okay, there's something else wrong. Do we do. No. Okay, we don't use the... That's confusing. 
All right, so no parentheses. I know why, because when you use the parentheses, it's like saying, do the function now and return. This is saying pass that function to the unchanged event. So now we have our fancy asynchronous UI stuff. Cool. Create a controlled form. The last challenge showed that React can control the, inter the internal state for certain elements like input and text area, which makes them controlled components. This applies to other form elements as well, including the regular HTML form element. The my form component is set up with an empty form with a submit handler. The submit handler will be called when the form is submitted. We've added a button which submits the form. You can see it has the type set to submit, indicating it is the button controlling the form. Add the input element in the form and set its value and on change attributes like the last challenge. You should then complete the handle submit method so that it sets the component state property submit to the current input value in the local state. You also must call event prevent default in the submit handler to prevent the default form submit behavior which will refresh the web page. Finally, create an h1 tag after the form which renders the submit value from the component state. You can then type in the form and click the button or press enter and you should see your input rendered to the page. Alright, so we have this state here, we have input and submit. The bindings are set up, set up for us. Handle change has been set up for us. We need to write out the handle submit stuff and finish out the form. So, the input element in the form and set its value and on change attributes like we did in the last. Um, I believe that goes right here. So, input type equals text. Um, the value is going to equal this state input and the on change. It's gonna equal this on change. Um, and then we need to close out the input. So we got our input there. Should then complete the handle submit method so that it sets the component state property submit to the current input value in the local state. Um, so this set state, we're updating the submit value. Um, the current input value on the local state. So we want this state input. We also need to use a event prevent default and that prevents the button to um, refreshing the page. Finally, create an h1 tag right here after the form which renders the submit value from the component state so h1 um, this state submit so now we have this which oh it's not working
type type tax value Oh, it's not on change here, it's handle change. Alright. Um handle change, like the method name, not on change. Like that. Like the attribute name. Alright. That should that should do it. I wanna play with it though. So we type some stuff in here and submit and that shows up. Cool. state as props to child components. You saw a lot of examples that pass props to child JSX elements and child React components in previous challenges. You may be wondering where those props come from. A common pattern is to have a stateful component containing the state important to your app that then renders child components. You want these components to have access to some pieces of that state which are passed in as props. For example, maybe you have an app component that renders a nav bar among other components. In your app, you have a state you have state that contains a lot of user information, but the navbar only needs access to the user's username so it can display it. You pass that piece of state to the navbar component as a prop. This pattern illustrates some important paradigms in React. The first is uni, unidirectional data flow. State flows in one direction down the tree of your application's components from the stateful parent component to child components. The child components only receive the state data they need. The second is, the com is that complex stateful apps can be broken down into just a few or maybe a single stateful component. The rest of your components simply receive state from the parent as props and render a UI form from that state. It begins to create a separation where state management is handled in one part of the code and UI rendering in another. This principle of separating state logic from UI logic is one of RAG's key principles. When it's used correctly, it makes the design of complex stateful applications much easier to manage. The MyApp component is stateful and renders a navbar component as a child. Pass the name property in the state down to the child component, then show the name on the h1 tag that's part of the navbar render method. We have our MyApp my here. It has a state, uh, default state of name camper bot. Our code needs to go in here. Uh, we need to pass that down. Um, and then we need to display it here. So we just pass it as a prop, right? So name equals this dot state name, I believe. Passing just the name. Hello, my name is. We have props here, so we should just be able to say. this props name and we can get rid of this comment hello my name is camperbot i see all right pass a callback as props you can pass state as props to child components but you're not limited to passing data you can also pass handler functions or any method that defined that's defined on a rack component to a child component this is how you allow child components to interact with their parent component. You pass methods to a child just like a regular prop. It's assigned a name and you have access to that method name under this props in the child component. There are three components outlined in the code editor. The MyApp component is the parent that will render the get input and render input child components. Add the get input component to the render method in my app, then pass it a prop called input assigned to input value for my app state. Also create a prop called handle change and pass the input handler handle change to it. Next add render input to the render method in my app, then create a prop called input and pass the input value from state to it. Once you're finished, you'll be able to type in the input field in the get input component, which then calls the handler method in its parent in its parent via props. This updates the input in the state of the parent, which is passed as props to both children. Observe how the data flows between the components and how the single source of truth remains the state of the parent component. Admittedly, this example is a bit contrived, but it should serve to illustrate how data and callbacks can be passed 
between React components. All right, so let's take a look at this. We have our component my app with initial state input value. We have a handle change method. We have a render that we'll have to update. And then we have a get input class. Um, seems to be all self-contained. There are three components outlined in the code. So this is going to render the child components. So we're going to render get input. Um, then pass it a prop called input. So input. This will equal this state input value. Um, then we also need our we have a handle change prop. So instead of handling it here where you're passing it down so not changle uh change so this will equal this uh handle change next we're going to add our render input um, to render to the render method, this then create a prop called input and pass the input value from state to it. So we have another input value here. So this state input value. And then uh, we'll close out the element. So that's basically it. We have two inputs and we're passing, um, well not two inputs, but we have two components um, and they both get from the my app state. Um, and the handle change Sets it, sets the state to the new target value. Um, then we just look at the props passed to this and we get the input. We can also do the handle change. Well, that's the handle change prop. So here's where we just render it. This props input. Hi. Do it over here. Guess so, yeah. Use the lifecycle method component will mount. React components have several special methods that provide opportunities to perform actions at specific points in the lifecycle of a component. These are called lifecycle methods or lifecycle hooks and allow you to catch components at certain points in time. This can be before they are rendered, before they update, before they receive props, before they unmount, and so on. Here's a list of some of the main lifecycle methods. Component will mount, component did mount, component will receive props, should component update, component will update, component did update, and component will unmount. The next several lessons will cover some of the basic use cases for these lifecycle methods. Component will mount method is called before the render method when a component is being mounted to the DOM. Log something to the console within component will mount. You may want to have your browser console open to see the output. So this happens before any, any rendering, so... We use console log. Yo. Um, that's it, I believe. Use the lifecycle method, component did mount. 
Most web developers at some point need to call an API endpoint to retrieve data. If you're working with React, it's important to know where to perform this action. The best practice with React is to place API calls or any calls to your server in the lifecycle method component did mount. This method is called after a component is mounted to the DOM. Any calls to set state here will trigger a re-rendering of your component. When you call an API in this method and set your state with the data that the API returns, it will automatically trigger an update once you receive the data. There's a mock API call in component did mount. It sets state after 2.5 seconds to simulate calling a server to retrieve data. This example requests the current total active users for the site in the render method, render the value of active users in the H1. Watch what happens in the preview and feel free to change the timeout to see different effects. So this component did mount has a set timeout for 2.5 seconds, 2500 milliseconds. Um, and then it will do this set state active users and it sets it. Um, so it wants us to change the code here. And we just look at the state, right? So this um, state active users. So it just takes a couple seconds. If we did zero, it'd be automatic. If we do a thousand, it'll take one second. One, two seconds. One, two, uh, three seconds. One, two, three. All right, cool. And that's just to pretend like we're hitting a server, kind of make you realize that the data is not going to show up instantly. Run the tests. Good to go. Add event listeners. The component did mount method is also the best place to attach any event listeners you need to add for specific functionality. React provides a synthetic event system which wraps the native event system pre present in browsers. This means that the synthetic event system behaves exactly the same regardless of the user's browser, even if the native events may behave differently between different browsers. We've already been using some of these synthetic event handlers such as onclick. React's synthetic event system is great to use for most interactions you manage on DOM elements. However, if you want to attach an event handler to the document or window objects, you have to do this directly. Attach an event listener to the component did mount in the component did mount method for key down events and have these events trigger the callback handle key press. You can use document add event listener, which takes the event in quotes as the first argument and the callback is the second argument. Then in component will unmount, remove the same event listener. You can pass the same arguments to document remove event listener. It's good practice to use this lifecycle method to do any cleanup on React components before they are unmounted and destroyed. Removing event listeners is an example of one such cleanup action. So we have our component, my component, the state, the message is blank. We have our bindings here for handle enter and handle key press so that we can use this within them. Um, we have our handle enter that sends, sets the message. This looks for a certain key. Um, which 13 equals enter, so this will have handle enter. So in our component did mount method, it wants um, let's use document add event listener, um, which takes the event in quotes, um, so it's key down, we're looking at, the callback is the second, and the callback, I believe, is just this handle key press.
Maybe I'm doing this right. We'll find out. Um, document, remove, event listener, key down. Do we have to pass it? Thing? I believe we do. Um, this handle key press. That should be right. So on these, we're adding event listeners. So uh, component did mount when it mounts. Um, we add an event listener from key down that does handle key press. Uh, handle key press. If the event key code is 13, then we do this handle enter, which does this set state the message equals this state message plus you press the enter key. Uh, so it only does anything if you press the enter key and appends it and I think we're good we gotta run the test in here all right manage updates with lifecycle methods another lifecycle method is component will receive props which is called whenever a component is receiving new props. This method receives the new props as an argument, which is usually written as next props. You can use this argument and compare with this props and perform actions before the component updates. For example, you may call set state locally before the update is processed. Another method is component did update. This is called immediately after a component re-renders. Note that rendering and mounting are considered different things in the component lifecycle. When a page first loads, all components are mounted, and this is where methods like component will mount and component did mount are called. After this, as state changes, components re-render themselves. The next challenge covers this in more detail. The child component dialog receives message props from its parent. From its parent, the controller component. Write the component will receive props method in the dialog component and have it log this props and next props to the console. You'll need to pass next props as an argument to this method, and although it's possible to name it anything, name it next props here. Next, add component did update in the dialog component. In the log, a statement that says the component has updated. This method works similar to the component will update, which is provided for you. Now click the button to change the message and watch your browser console. The order of the console statements show the order the methods are called. Note, you'll need to write the lifecycle methods as normal functions and not as arrow functions to pass the test. There's also no advantage to writing lifecycle methods as arrow functions. Okay. I don't know why you're telling me that right now. Um... The child component, let's see here. We have our dialog component. Um, it has a component will update, which logs out some stuff. We have render that returns this props message, which has our first message from our controller. We have our controller here um, with this state message is first message and our bindings for change message. We have our change message uh, method that sets the state to uh, of message to equal second message. And then we're rendering all of this stuff, the button that handles the change message on a click and the dialogue, which is equal to the current message. So we need to be right here and we need to create a component. Um, will receive props um, console log this props and next props um, 
have to pass next props to this. Next, we're gonna add a component did update in the dialog component. So component did update console log add a statement that says the components as updated. I'll click the button and change the message and watch your browser console. is about to update component has updated re-renders with should component update. So far, if any component receives new state or new props, it re-renders itself and all its children. This is usually okay. React provides a lifecycle method you can call when child components receive new state or props and declares specifically if the component should update or not. The method is should component update and it takes next props and next state as parameters. This method is a useful way to optimize performance. For example, default behavior is that your component re-renders when it receives new props, even if the props haven't changed. You can use should component update to prevent this by comparing the props. The methods must return a Boolean value that tells React whether or not to update the component. You can compare the current props, this props, to the next props to determine if you need to update or not and return true or false accordingly. The should component update method is added in a component called only evens. Currently, this method returns true, so only evens re-renders every time it receives new props. Modify the method so only evens updates only if the value of its new props is even. Click the add button and watch the order of events in your browser's console as the other lifecycle hooks are triggered. So we have return true. Here, should I update? And we need to do something um, that only returns true if the current props value is a zero so we can do return next props value um, Missing something here. Next props to have value. That's odd. This one's not working. I wonder if we have to. It's only updating every two clicks. Um, to do that, we're just using the modulus next props value modulus two. We see it. We want to see that when we divide the value by two, it's clean. So you expect for it to be clean, you divide the you 
expect no remainder, so you would expect zero if it's clean. So we just throw this exclamation in front and wrap in parentheses uh, to make it a boolean and be the opposite. So if there is no remainder, um, you divide by two, should update. Introducing inline styles. There are other complex concepts that add powerful capabilities to your React code, but you may be wondering about the more simple problem of how to style those JSX elements you create in React. You likely know that it won't be exactly the same as working with HTML because of the way you apply classes to JSX elements. If you import styles from a style sheet, it isn't much different at all. You apply a class to your JSX element using the class name attribute apply styles to the class in your style sheet. Another option is to apply inline styles, which are very common in React JS uh, development. Apply inline styles to JSX elements similar to how you do it in HTML, but with a few JSX differences. Here's an example of the inline style of, in HTML. JSX elements use the style attribute, but because of the way JSX is transpiled, you can't set the value to a string. Instead, you set it to equal to a JavaScript object. Here's an example. So we have color yellow, font size 16. Notice how we camel case the font size property. This is because React will not accept Bob case keys in the style object. React will apply to the correct property name for us in the HTML. Add a style attribute to the div in the code editor to give the text a color of red and font size of 72 pixels. Note that you can optionally set the font size to be a number meaning the unit's px, or write it as 72 pixels as a string. So, we just do style equals, and it's gonna be jsx here, so we do two brackets here, because um, it's jsx, it's javascript in the jsx, so that's what the first set is for. And then this is the object that we're returning, which contains our CSS. So the color is going to be red, and the font size is going to be 72, about the PX. Add inline styles in React. You may have noticed in the last challenge that there were several other syntax differences from HTML inline styles in addition to the style attribute set to a JavaScript object. First, the names of certain CSS style properties use camel case. For example, the last challenge set the size of the font size with font size instead of font-size. Hyphenated words like font-size are invalid syntax for JavaScript object properties. React uses camel case. As a rule, any hyphenated style properties are written using camel case in JSX. All property value length units like height, width, and font size are assumed to be in pixels unless otherwise specified. If you want to use EM, for example, you wrap the value and the units in quotes, like font size 40m, other than the length uh, length values that the default to px. All other property values should be wrapped in quotes. If you have a large set of styles, you can assign a style object to, to a constant to keep your code organized. Uncomment the style's constant, declare an object with three pro style properties and their values. Give the div a color of purple, font size of 40, and a border of 2 pixels solid purple. Then set the style attribute equal to the style's constant. So we're gonna uncomment this here. Const styles equals. This is gonna be an object, and we will do color uh, purple, and font size is gonna be 40, and border is going to be two pixel solid oh my god purple um we need a pull in here now instead of this object here we're going to replace it with the styles const so we have our updated style Use advanced JavaScript and React render method. In previous challenges, you learned how to inject JavaScript code into GX code using curly braces. 
For tasks like accessing props, passing props, accessing state, inserting comments into your code, and most recently styling your components, these are all common use cases to put JavaScript in JSX. They aren't the only way that you can utilize JavaScript code in your React components. You can also write JavaScript directly in your rendered methods before the return state without inserting it inside of curly braces. This is because it is not yet within the JSX code. When you want to use a variable later in the JSX code inside the return statement, you place the variable name inside curly braces. In the code provided, the render method has an array that contains 20 phrases to represent the answers found in the classic 1980s Magic 8 Ball toy. Button click event is bound to the ask method. So each time the button is clicked, a random number will be generated and stored as a random index in state. On line 52, delete the string change me and reassign the answer counts so your code randomly accesses a different index of the possible answers array each time the component updates. Finally, insert the answer counts inside the p-tags. So we have a counts for our input style here. We have a class magic eight ball um, with initial state user input is nothing and random index nothing. We have our bindings um so that we have the, this keyword within these methods ask is set to if this state user input this set state random index math floor times 20 um and user input to nothing handle change event this sets the state the user input to the event of the target value. So what we're typing in here, we have a render um, before our return, we have our const possible answers, which is just an array um, of, I guess, 20 different possible things. And we have to change our code here. Okay, so then we have our return with the input it has all our stuff for us. And we also have to output the answer here. So for this, we just have to say answer, which is change me currently. Um, so answer wants to be going to be possible answers and we're going to use the random index in here um, but we have to use this state random index um, and then we just Ask a question. We have to have a question in here for it to work and it just, all right. Um, looks good. Runs the test just fine. Render with an if else condition. Another application of using JavaScript to control your rendered view is to tie the elements that are rendered to a condition. When the condition is true, one view renders. When it's false, a different view. You can do this with a standard if else statement in the render method of a React component. My component contains a Boolean uh, in its state, which tracks whether you want to display some element in the UI or not. The button toggles the state of this value. Currently, it renders the same UI every time. We write the render method if with an if else statement so that if display is true, then you return the current mock markup, otherwise return the markup without the H1 element. No, you must write an if else to pass the test. Use of a ternary operator will not pass here. All right, so... So if um, this state display 
We're going to render this first bit here. We'll tab this in so that's ooh, a little nicer. And then we'll have an else here. And we're going to take this return and out the HTML element. So now we can toggle the displayed. We use and and for a more concise conditional. The if else statements worked in the last challenge, but there's a more concise way to achieve the same result. Imagine that you are tracking several conditions in a component and you want different elements to render depending on each of these conditions. To write a lot of else if statements to return slightly different UIs, you may repeat code, which leaves room for error. Instead, you can use the and and logical operator to perform a conditional logic in a more concise way. This is possible because you want to check if a condition is true, and if it is, return some markup. Here's an example. If the condition is true, the markup will be returned. If the condition is false, the operation will immediately return false after evaluating the condition and return nothing. You can include these statements directly in your JavaScript or your JSX and string multiple conditions together, writing and and after each one. This allows you to handle more complex conditional logic in your render method without repeating a lot of code. Solve the previous example again so the H1 only renders if display is true, but use the and and logical operator instead of, of an if else statement. So, we have a return here. Um, look at this example. So, I believe we can just do this state display. Do we have to do that in bracket? This state display. Does that work? Oh. What? I see. So instead of doing it out here, it wants us to do it here. So we do our JSX brackets and we do this state display and and. There we go. Use a ternary expression for conditional rendering. Before moving on to dynamic rendering techniques, there's one last way to use built-in JavaScript conditionals to render what you want, the ternary operator. The ternary operator is often utilized as a shortcut for if-else statements in JavaScript. They're not quite as robust as traditional if-else statements, but they are very popular among React developers. 
One reason for this is because of how JSX is compiled. If else statements can't be inserted directly into J JSX code. You might have noticed this a couple challenges ago when an if else statement was required, it was always outside the return statement. Ternary expressions can be an excellent alternative if you want to in implement conditional logic in your JSX. Recall that a ternary operator has three parts, but you can combine several ternary expressions together. Here's the basic syntax. The condition, uh, question mark, expression if true, and then colon, expression if false. The code editor has three cons constants defined with the check user age components render method. They are called button one, button two, and button three. Each of these is assigned a simple JSX expression representing a button element. First, initialize the state of check user age with input and user age both set to values of an empty string. Once the component is rendering information to the page, users should have a way to interact with it. Then the component's return statement set up a ternary expression that implements the following logic. When the page first loads, render the submit bu button one to the page. Then when a user enters their age and clicks the button, render a different button based on the age. If the user enters a number less than 18, render button 3. If the user enters a number greater than or equal to 18, render button 2. So we have our input style here. We have our check user age. Um, we're going to have to set our code here. And change some code here. Um... change um first initialize the state of check user age oh, okay there's no state here Uh, equals this object with input is nothing and user age is nothing in our colon here have enter your age to continue so it's gonna wait until we have an age um, Now we need to render a button here. Um, so for our first condition, we're going to check this state user age. And we're going to check for input. Um, it, let's see here. Our first option is other oh, constants, so button one. Otherwise, we're going to use button two. So, but we want to check that there is no input. Um, 
we show button one, but then we want to see, we want to look at this state user age. This is a new condition. Junicus, sup, how is FCC going? Having fun? Ah, starters of a porn site. Yes. Old age consent. If they are not the right age, we'll redirect them to the Disney website. Um, so the second conditional, we're looking at this state user age, and we want to see if it's less than 18. And if that is less than 18, we're going to use button 2. Um, otherwise, we'll use button 3. So now we can test it out. We have no age entered, so we have our submit button. Um, that's not right. Or does it only change first time? What? <laughs> what am I doing wrong here? swapped it on me so that's the first part here um, you shall not pass let's see if this fixes it, it does not um, is this supposed to be like that let's run this test here and see what it says And the button is clicked. But that's all set, isn't it? <laughs> On submit, the set state equals user age. Maybe I don't look at... Um, input how are you doing today junicus um okay now it's i see so i think this would work we're gonna refresh the page here Um, because the user age does not, the, the state input gets changed asynchronously as you type. We want it to happen um, only if the user age
Yeah, this doesn't seem right. Great, got off work early, have a shift later, but meh, what can we do? Yeah, work sucks. I need to be working right now, but we're doing this instead. Um, let me look at all of this. So we have our state input is empty string, user age is empty string. Handle change accepts the event and it sets this set state to the event's target value. That's how the asynchronous stuff works. Um, and then the user age is still nothing. When we submit, then we set the user age to the current input. We have our three buttons. Enter your age to continue. So if state user age is equal to this, we should show button one. Um, I feel like that should work. You may enter 12, you shall not pass. All right, I don't know what I was doing wrong, but we've got it working. So that's good. All right, so we're using the ternary. So we don't have to use complicated if else's to check that the state's user age is equal to the default of an empty input string. Um, then uh, we show button one, if that's the case. So if there's nothing here, we have Smith. Um, Once we submit, state user age will not equal the empty string. So we go to this next, next check and we look to see if the state's user age is less than 18. If it is, we use button three, not use two. Render conditionally from props. So far, you've seen how to use if else and and null and the ternary operator. That doesn't make sense. Uh, to make conditional, oh, I see it. Condition uh, decisions about what to render and when. However, there's one important topic left to discuss that's, that lets you combine any or all of these concepts with another powerful React feature, props. Using props to conditionally render code is very common with React developers. That is, they use the value of a given prop to automatically make decisions about what to render. This challenge is set up a child component to make rendering decisions based on props. You will also use the ternary operator, but you can see how several of the other concepts that were covered in the last few challenges might be just as useful in this context. The code editor has two components that are partially defined for you, a parent called game of chance and a child called results. You're used to create a simple game where the user presses a button to see if they win or lose. First you'll need a simple expression that randomly returns a different value every time it is run. You can use math random. This method returns a value between 0 and 1 each time it is called. So for 50-50 odds, use math random is greater than 0.5 in your expression. Statistically speaking, this expression will return true 50% of the time and false the other 50%. On line 30, replace the comment with this expression to complete the variable declaration. Now you have an expression that you can use to make a randomized decision in the code. Next, you need to implement this. Render the results component as a child of game of chance and pass in expression as a prop called 50-50. In the results component, write a ternary expression to render the text you win or you lose based on 50-50 prop that's being passed in from the game of chance parent component. Finally, make sure the handle click method is correctly counting each turn so that the user knows how many times they've played. This also serves to let the user know that the component has actually updated in case they win or lose twice in a row.
Well, what do you do for work, Junicus? See here. So we have our results component. We have our game of chance component. First, you'll need a simple expression that randomly returns a different value every time it is run. Um, so that's right here. So we can do math random is greater than 0.5, and that will get rid of, or that will do our first step here. Um, now we'll have to have an expression that you can use to make a randomized decision or now we have that next we'll need to implement it render the results component as a child of game of chance so we're right here we need to render the results component so we'll do it this way then we pass it an expression and that will be as a prop called 50 50. Okay, so 50, 50 is the prop name and that will equal the expression. Um, let me close out this component. Then the results component write a ternary expression to render the state you win or you lose based on the 50 50 prop. So this props 50 50. We have our ternary. So if it is, we say you win. And if it's under, you lose. Um, finally, make sure the handle click method is correctly counting. Um, so this needs to equal this state counter plus one. I'll get rid of that. And I think this is results. Not result. There we go. You lose. We've li we've lost. Um, play again. All right. So it seems to be working. It the company I work for manages a few franchises, uh, restaurants. That's interesting. Do you do you program for your job or are you like IT support or do you work on a specific thing? If you can say. Test here, we've passed. Right, change inline CSS conditionally based on the component state. At this point, you've seen several applications of conditional rendering in the use of inline styles. Here's one more example that combines both of these topics. You can also render CSS conditionally based on the state of, React, of a React component. To do this, you check for a condition, and if that condition is met, you modify the styles object that's assigned to the JSX elements in the render method. This paradigm is important to understand because it is a dramatic shift from the more traditional approach of applying styles by modifying DOM elements directly, which is very common with jQuery, for example. 
Now, approach, you must keep track of when elements change and also handle the actual manipulation directly. It can become difficult to keep track of changes, potentially making your UI unpredictable. When you set a style object based on a condition, you describe how the UI should look as a function of that application state. There's a clear flow of information that only moves in one direction. This is the preferred method when writing applications with React. The code editor has a simple controlled input component with a styled border. You want to style the border red if the user types more than 15 characters of text into the input box. Add a condition to check for this and if the condition is valid, set the input's border style to 3 pixel solid red. You can try it out by entering text in the input. IT support mostly, I program every so often. Nice. Uh, what are your favorite languages? I'm not sure if I've, I'm not sure if you've been here. Your name looks familiar. I have a terrible memory, so I apologize if you haven't. Um, so we have our state input. Let input style equal. So can we do a ternary here instead? Let's. So could we do like um, this state input uh, length? It's greater than 15, and if so, we return one thing, and if not, the other. Can we do that? Is that a thing we can do? Looks to be. Find out. Um, and it wants three pixels solid red. Input. It's less than 15. We return the black one. Duh. C sharp, I do some JS2. Alright. So that should do it. We didn't quite uh, Change it where they want it, but that should be fine, I hope. Let's run the tests. Yeah. Yep. Well, exactly what it does. Oh, less than or equal to 15. Shut up. I knew that. I knew that. Use array map to dynamically render elements. Conditional rendering is, use is useful, but you may need to your components to render an unknown number of elements. Often in reactive programming, a programmer has no way to know what the state of an application is until runtime because so much depends on a user's interaction with the program. Programmers need to write their code to correctly handle that unknown state ahead of time. Using array map in React illustrates this concept. For example, you create a simple to-do list app. As a programmer, you may have no way of knowing how many items a user might have on their list. 
need to set up your component to dynamically render the correct number of list elements long before someone using the program decides today that today is laundry day. The code editor has most of the my to-do list components set up. Some of this code should look familiar if you completed the controlled form challenge. You'll notice a text area and a button along with a couple of methods that track their states, but nothing is rendered to the page yet. Inside the constructor, create a this state object and define two states. User input should be initialized as an empty string and to-do list should be initialized as an empty array. Let's do that right now. This state equals our object. We're gonna do user input here and then it should be an empty string. And then to-do list is going to be an empty array. Next, delete the comment in the render method. Okay. Next to the items variable. Displace map over the to-do list array stored in the component's internal state and dynamically render a li for each item. Items equals null. Um, this place map over the to do list array stored in components to state and dynamically render a list for each item. So we have our UL here, so we should just, I think. Um, right. So we take this uh, state to do list and we are going to use um, map and for every item. Uh, for every item in the list, we are going to return a list with the item inside of it. I'm Do we have to do this? What is the shape of the to do's item? Um, the shape is it's just a comma separated array list, I believe. Um, So eat, code, sleep, repeat. Okay, so that does work. They know that all sibling child elements created by a mapping operation like this do need to be supplied with a unique Key attribute. Don't worry, this is the topic of the next challenge. Yeah, it probably is. Um, according to that note there. run the tests this one passes now we'll learn about giving things a key give sibling elements a unique key attribute last challenge showed how the map method is used to dynamically render a number of elements based on user input however there was an important piece missing from that example when you create an array of elements each one needs a key attribute set to a unique value react uses these keys to keep track of which items are added changed or removed this helps make the re-rendering process more efficient when the list is modified in any way. 
Note that keys only need to be unique between sibling elements. They don't need to be globally unique in your application. Code, code Editor has an array with some front-end frameworks and a stateless functional component named Frameworks. Frameworks needs to map the array to an underordered list, much like in the last challenge. Finish writing the map callback to return an LI element for each framework in the front-end frameworks array. This time, make sure to give each LI a key attribute set to a unique value. Normally you want to make the key something that uniquely identifies the element being rendered as a last resort. The rate index may be used, but typically you should try to use a unique identification. All right. So this is what you were talking about here, Junix. So we have our constant front end frameworks. We have our front, our frameworks function. We need to map here and create our list items. So we just do render frameworks equals front end frameworks. We're going to map over it. This time we are going to pass the item and the index. Um, and then from that we will return the front no, 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 no. We'll return. Um, let's actually put this on a new line. We'll get rid of this. So we're already changing the code. We'll return the list item uh, with the item in it. And we need a key attribute. So we should have key equals. And it says we could use the index here, but we should try to use something unique. So instead, we will use uh, front end uh, frameworks and we will pass the index so we get the string for that instead of um, just a number. So the keys aren't actually shown, but if we look at the console, we copy and paste this and refresh, perhaps we won't have any errors. Nah, do some kind of hash. Yeah, I'm not gonna do that for a testing thing for, uh, for this, but I get you. Um, Um, but yeah, I get you, because if two of these were the same, then it would probably not work, right? But, uh, we're gonna go ahead and not do that right now. Uh, use array filter to dynamically filter an array. The map array method is a powerful tool that you will use often when working with React. Another method related to map is filter, which filters the contents of an array based on a condition then returns a new array. For example, if you have an array of users that all have a property online, which can be set to true or false, you can filter only those users that are online by writing let online users equals users filter. We filter the users by those that are online. Uh, in the code editor, my component state is initialized with an array of users. Some users are online and some aren't. Filter the array so you see only the users who are online. To do this, first use filter to return a new array containing only the users whose online property is true. Then in the render online variable, map over the filtered array and return a list element for each user that contains the text of their username. Be sure to include a unique key as well in the last challenge. Right, so we got this state we have in the state we have a users array list of item of users their username whether they're online so 
So first we're going to only find the users that are online. Um, that makes sense. You want to filter things down first so you're not iterating over things you don't need to. So this we will do this state. Um, users and we will filter and we get the user and we will only return those users that are online so i believe that does that and then we want to render so this is where we need to this um no we users online and we map and we will get our user and our index and we will return um, uh, we'll return our list with our key this time we'll do an index like you suggested there um June kiss so we could do what can we do like index um kind of like that wrong use back text for string interpolation i mean is it wrong if it works though it's kind of a bad language to be using Username. This has to be in curly brackets as well. terminated JSX contents. Ah, I gotcha. Yeah, that would probably be better. Probably not needed for this. Let's see, look at your example here. Item and then index. So we have um, space this is a fucking 
more complex example. Um, well, that's that's needed. Uh, we'll definitely need. Ah, uh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, so we need to wrap this in the curly brackets because it's JavaScript or JSX. And then we have our better hash here. But again, yeah, it probably doesn't really matter. Um, Render React on the server with render to string. So far, you have been rendering React components on the client. Normally, this is what you will always do. However, there are some use cases where it makes sense to render a React component on the server. Since React is a JavaScript view library, you can run JavaScript on the server with Node. This is possible. In fact, React provides a render to string method you can use for this purpose. There are two key reasons why rendering on the server may be used in a real-world app. First, without doing this, your React apps would consist of a relatively empty HTML file and a large bundle of JavaScript when it's initially loaded to the browser. This may not be ideal for search engines that are trying to index the contents of your pages so people can find you. If you render the initial HTML markup on the server and send this to the client, the initial page load contains all the page's markup, which can be crawled by search engines. Second, this creates a faster initial page load experience because the rendered HTML is smaller than the JavaScript code of the entire app. React will still be able to recognize your app and manage it after the initial load. The render to string method provide, is provided on React DOM server, which is available here as a global object. The method takes one argument, which is a React element, and uses this to render app to a string. Yeah. It is good that they teach that. All right, so write it on the React. So React DOM server render to string. Can we pass that? we do that or do we have to write it as a component? I think we have to write it as a component. There we go. All right, well, that's it for uh, React. How long did that take? Hmm, that took a couple, three hours. Holy shit. So tomorrow we have introduction to the Redux challenges Redux is a predictable state container for JavaScript apps. It helps you write applications that behave consistently, run in different environments, client, server, and native, and are easy to test. While you can use Redux with any view library, it's introduced here before being combined with React. All right, sweet. Yes. Yep, they have Redux. Um, so I'll we'll do this Redux lesson tomorrow. We will do the React and Redux probably tomorrow as well. Today is Wednesday, yeah. And then the next week we will or five. We'll probably start building out these libraries here.
All right, well, that's that's it for me. I am hungry AF. I need something to eat. Ugh. Well. Thank you, uh, Digicrest and Junicus for stopping by. Uh, if you guys enjoyed the content and haven't yet, please give me a follow. It would be much appreciated. I will be back later tonight, 8 p.m. EST, for some Clash Royale. I'll also be back tomorrow afternoon, 1 p.m. EST, for some more free Code Camp. We'll be learning about Redux and probably React and Redux as well. Besides that, tomorrow will be my last day for the week, so I'll be back next Monday after that. Catch y'all later. Peace.